Nehemiah, the son of Hakali, and it came to pass the month Chislu, in the 20th year as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. It came to pass when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept, mourned certain days and fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, by the word that were terrible in the old English, had the idea of awesome, right? Not in the sense that we use the word terrible today. But the awesome God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive, and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night, for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house of sin. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me, and keep my commandments, and do them, though there were of you cast out into the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let, thy, let now thy ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. Let's just pray here as we begin. I want to speak to you tonight on being stirred to action and to ask the Lord to help us as we look at this chapter. Father, we come to you this evening thankful for your word. We're thankful for men like Nehemiah who still live today. Lord, who when there is a need, when the knowledge of a need comes, Lord, they're stirred to action. They don't wait. They don't stand still. But Lord, as you move on their heart, they act. And Lord, I pray that tonight that knowledge is not something that would just puff us up, but Lord, that knowledge would lead us to action as your people. Lord, as we see needs around us, Lord, be a physical need, be a spiritual need. Lord, as you move on our hearts and reveal those needs to us, let us be people of action. Lord, let us do according to thy will. Even tonight, as we enter into your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you look at the book of Nehemiah, the first thing that we meet here is the writer. The Bible tells us the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakali, and it came to pass among Chislu in the 20th years I was in Shushan the palace. Well, as we look at those words, they don't necessarily have a whole lot of meaning to us. Just to give you a little background, Shushan is a place that today is known as Susa, and it was the winter residence for the Persian kings. That's where they would go and spend their winters, and of course, uh, if, if, I, if I was in a snowy area, then I would probably spend my winter somewhere nicer as well. But that was kind of the resort area, something that they would go to every winter. The time, we're told here in verse number one as well, gives us a particular month. The idea here, and, and all of this account, is taking place in 445 B.C. We can match what he tells us in these verses to what we know historically and through archaeology, and that's the approximate time it was written, 445 B.C. Now, reminding ourselves that the Babylonian captivity and the destruction of Jerusalem was 586 B.C., so 140 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, here Nehemiah is going to be stirred to go and rebuild the city, remembering also that it was about 516 B.C. that the temple was rebuilt after its initial destruction. So we know those things just from the background. But we also meet the man, Nehemiah himself. And just the very name Nehemiah is something that's very rich. The name Nehemiah has the idea of the Lord comforts. How rich is that? Jehovah comforts. We saw this morning in the, in the book of Matthew how Jesus spoke of how he wished that the people of Jerusalem would just come to him and he would gather them under his wings as a chicken, as a hen does to her, to her little chicks. He said, I wish that I could bring you to myself and provide that refuge and that safety. And our God still does that to us today. He comforts us. There's a lot that can trouble us today. There's a lot on the national scene. There's a lot on the worldwide scene that could trouble us. Praise God, there's comfort in the Lord. 
There's a lot that we'll face in our personal lives. There are things that could distress us, maybe financially, maybe, maybe physically, things that can worry us. And aren't you glad that the Lord comforts? Aren't you glad that you can go to Him and just find that strength and that encouragement? David, when he was faced with potential assassination, in fact, after his family had been carried away, all of his wife and children by the Amalekites and, uh, and, and, and his men, as they found out that their wives and their children were also carried captive from Ziklag, you know, they talked about stoning David. The Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. The Lord is the one who brings comfort. Aren't you glad for that? We read in Isaiah 51, verse number 12. There the Lord says, I, even I, am he that comforteth you. 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And when Jesus went away, what did he promise to give us? A comforter. Praise God, there is a place of comfort. There's a place of rest. There's a place where, though our heart is breaking, the Bible tells us the Lord is nigh unto them of a broken heart. He's the God of all comfort. He's the one that we need to go to. And when we are confused, and when our life is in dismay, and when we are in despair, go to the Lord. He has comfort for us. Praise God for that. The God of all comfort. Nehemiah, Jehovah comforts. And you know He's going to comfort this man's heart. Praise God for that. Notice here we look at verses 2 and 3. We see not only the writer here in this passage, but we also see the report. And, and this is, of course, key, kind of setting the groundwork for the entire book of what is going to follow here in this book of Nehemiah. But notice what we're told. Then Hannah and I, one of my brethren, came. And the idea there is brethren is he literally either was a brother or a cousin to Nehemiah. And he came, and certain men of Judah as well. And he asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And, and so here are these ones. They've been in Jerusalem. They've been on this, this, this journey, and now they've come back. And he says, you know, how's it going over there? What's happening with the Jews? What, what's going on with Jerusalem? What's it like? And notice the report. They said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity, and he gives two, two answers to this. First of all, the remnant are in great affliction and reproach. Well, just how awful was it? What was this great affliction? Well, hold your place there in Nehemiah chapter number 1, and you'll discover it in Nehemiah chapter number 5. So let's go to chapter 5 here. Nehemiah chapter 5 is going to tell us what is going on at this point in time, which Nehemiah has uh, these words brought to him. Notice in verse number 1, as Nehemiah at this point in chapter 5 is back in Jerusalem, we're kind of jumping ahead here, but it will give us a little bit of groundwork for what's going on with the people. It says, There was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. For there were, the, uh, there were that said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. So also there were that said, We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses that we might buy corn because of the dirt. What we find in this passage, in fact... Notice in verse number 5, Yet now our flesh is the flesh of our brethren, our children is their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. Some of our daughters are brought into bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. Here's what's going on. Here's the scenario. Here's how great of an of a, of a, of a issue there is in Jerusalem as Hananiah comes to Nehemiah. What he discovers is this. There is such a famine in the land. The people are having to buy food. And in order to buy food, and those that have the food have such power, because the people are so hungry that they bought up all their lands. But it's worse than that. Not only are these people having to sell their lands, but as you read in this passage, they have actually sold their children into slavery. They said, we have no way of providing food for them. We have no way of providing food for us. The situation, the circumstances are so awful, they have had to sell their sons and their daughters. When we read back in Nehemiah chapter number 1, it just kind of speaks generally where it talks there about how the people are in great affliction and reproach. You know, I'm glad I've never had to live in a day like that. But can you imagine being so hungry and being so desperate? You have no money, you have no gold, you have no lands, you have no food, and the only way to provide for yourself is to go to these greedy people who are taking advantage of your poverty and saying, well, if you sell me your daughter, I'll give you some food. What a terrible place. What, what an awful circumstance. 
But this is what Nehemiah hears. Notice the second thing that he's also told in verse number 3. He says, not only are the people in this terrible affliction and reproach, but the wall is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Now, while we hear that, while Nehemiah hears that, the reality is it's been like that for 140 years. This isn't something new. In fact, this is something Nehemiah already this was knowledge that was already present. I'm sure that he had heard from the time that he was born as he grew up in a Jewish family. They probably recounted to him what had happened to them historically. He probably knew no doubt of Moses. He talks of Moses here. He knows the history of Israel. He knows how they've been scattered to other nations. And yet the Lord's promised to bring them back. And no doubt he's heard how that the city was burned with fire. He knows all these things. And yet notice the response here in verse number 4. It came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. You know, it's interesting. We look at verse number 11, we're told this, Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer. He's got it good. He himself, none of this affliction, none of what the people are suffering, all that's going on, it really has no bearing on his life. He's got it made. But when he hears these things, it breaks his heart. He mourns. The Bible tells us that he fasted. He prayed. You can see how intense it was. It wasn't just a fleeting moment. It wasn't just, you know, Lord, help these people. It wasn't an hour. It wasn't a day. It was days. He's in mourning and he's in prayer. Again, his personal position wasn't harmed. His personal, uh, his personal prosperity, he was still in a good position. But knowing the needs of others, it stirs and breaks his heart. What was it that ultimately broke him? I, I, I also have this question, and, and really I want to focus on this for just a moment. Ask this question of ourselves. Knowing that the walls have been broken down 140 years, and that none of this was new news to Nehemiah. Why was it that Nehemiah is now reacting this way? Why was it? Different commentators have different, have different reasons and, and have formulated different ideas. But could it be that finally this knowledge is taking hold of his heart? Now here's something I want to focus on here today. You know, it's easy for us to have understanding of, of someone else's issues and yet to just push that knowledge to the back of our mind. Yeah. You know, we, we could talk about hell as, as we looked at this morning. It's easy to have that knowledge and, and just really kind of push it aside. It's easy to have knowledge of somebody else in need and, and, and not really act. This understanding, I believe, for Nehemiah is no longer pushed to the back of his mind, but rather the need for action, for someone to stand in the gap, it's no longer pushed off on somebody else. Finally, someone who had the means to do something about it was going to be willing to act. You know, for you and I, we can grow cold to the suffering and brokenness around us, even in having knowledge of it. We've known of the horrors of abortion for a long time. Yeah, that's right, right. I mean, ultimately, what we've seen in Planned Parenthood this summer, is that news to us? I mean, they've been chopping up babies yeah. for 42 years. We've had that knowledge. I'm glad this summer finally being stirred to action. This isn't new news to us. It's just that same knowledge being brought back again. Occasionally, someone's going to be stirred. We've known of the needs of others, perhaps for help in their poverty or, or, or help in, in just being a friend. Maybe we can look at somebody and we can look at them and say, you know, they're going through a hard time and, and somebody should help them. And, and a month later, boy, they're going through a hard time and somebody should help them. We can see young people and recognize there's a godly need for mentors, uh, mentors or new believers who have a need for consistent godly friendships. But the question, does this knowledge get active? Knowledge puffs up without the action that comes with it. We can see and we can know of needs in the church. Maybe things like maintenance needs. 
We can see some that are laboring. We can see those needs and we can know that they're there. But do we act on them? We can know of needs in the nursery or visitation or prayer meeting. Hey, we know there's prayer meeting. We know we need to pray. But do we act on that knowledge? Is it empty knowledge? Or are we moved? And like I was talking about just a moment ago, we know and have known about the realities of hell. And we know about the realities of the coming tribulation. And we know that God cannot at all acquit the wicked. We know that except a sinner have somebody who will share the gospel with them, then they will spend eternity in an awful, fiery torment. Where the worm dies not, and the fire is never quenched. And we have that knowledge. Read Luke 16. We can hear a condemned sinner burning in the flames, crying out, Send somebody to ward my brothers. Send somebody. Somebody do something. We know Revelation chapter 20. Once in a while, you know what happens? Once in a while, this knowledge finally gets a hold of somebody. And somebody says, Someone better do something. I've got to do something. Sometimes it just takes a while, a while for that knowledge to move us. We can hear these things and, and maybe initially we respond and, and I think that what happens, now, now, now this is the risk, is that we look around and we see, well others have this knowledge and they're not doing anything, so maybe, maybe I don't need to do anything either. Simple question. Why is it that knowledge of serious needs does not move us? We know that Christ is moved by the feelings of our infirmities. Aren't you glad that He is? We're talking about how Jehovah comforts. He is touched. But why are we not touched? Sometimes maybe it's going out and finding the need. But when the need comes, why is it that we don't respond? We can look at history. We're reminded of a simple phrase. And there's a lot of truth to it. All that's necessary for the triumph of evil is what? That good men do nothing. That's all that's necessary. What's happened in America? Good men are doing nothing. Hey, the evil, they're busy. I'll tell you what, they are busy and they are spreading their agenda and they're winning the day. What are God's people doing? Some perish for a lack of knowledge, the Bible tells us, and that is somewhat more forgivable. What do you do with someone who has knowledge and won't act on that? Do we fail to act on knowledge because we don't really believe it? If we hear something but we don't really believe it, is that, is that why we're not acting on the knowledge that we have? The Bible recounts the story of a man who lost his life because he would not believe the knowledge shared with him. You can read about it in Jeremiah 40, verse 13 to 41, verse number 2. He knew what was coming. He was forewarned of what was about to happen. He was told about Ishmael, this man who was coming and plotting his death. And he was warned. But he wouldn't believe it. I don't have anything to fear from him. Take it easy. My life's not in danger. He just would not believe the word that was shared. And that lack of faith, that lack of believing the message, led to him not acting. Is, is that our issue? Do we hear about the needs? The needs of the lost? The needs of the brethren? Do we, do we hear about those needs and, and just not believe it? That's one question we could ask. Do we fail to act on the knowledge of the truth because we're distracted? That's another possibility. Remember that Jesus spoke to the disciples and when they came to him, what was it he said? He said, lift up your eyes on the fields where they're white already to harvest. But isn't it interesting how he told them, what did he say? Lift up your eyes. Where were their eyes at? What were they looking at? It was physical needs that had caught their attention. Maybe we fail to act on the knowledge of the truth because it's in. As a cupbearer, we look at this passage, Nehemiah held a high office. He wasn't merely a guinea pig. Being a cupbearer didn't mean simply that you just got to eat all the king's goodies and, and that he, when he came across something that was tainted, well, that was it. A cupbearer actually had a much greater role than that. The cupbearer was one not only got to taste the food, but he was in the presence of the king continually and would be a counselor. He was knowledgeable of everything that was going on. This was a high and noble position. 
Nehemiah, what he heard on this occasion, as he hears again, he's reminded again of the terrible straits of the people in Jerusalem, this time he's willing to set all of that aside and to risk his life. To go and confront the king and say, King, can I go back and help my... <clears throat> Hebrews 11, we find Moses. He was faced with uh, quite a choice, wasn't he? He might have been the next Pharaoh. The Bible tells us that he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. We fail to act on knowledge of the truth because it's simply inconvenient to us. Are we distracted? Do we fail to believe it? Or maybe we fail to act on that knowledge because it's something that takes us out of our comfort zone. We're just not comfortable. Not comfortable sharing our faith, or maybe we're just not comfortable going and helping a brother, or, or trying to be that that one to, to stand in the gap. Maybe we're just not comfortable. And I can remember as a as a young father, <laughs> there was some knowledge that I had that I wasn't too interested in acting on. I, I wasn't comfortable with changing diapers. In fact, I can remember when I first had nieces, and, and uh, my my niece was born, and, and my sister and my mother approaching me and, and saying, hey, Jared, why don't you change your diaper? You can use some practice. I said, no, I'm all right. And I'm glad I did. I mean, I've shared, I have changed my share of diapers since then. I remember we just had Andrew. Now, there was knowledge that this boy was in need of a change. I, I woke up one morning, and I went into the kitchen. My wife had gone to work as while I was in seminary, and I'm working in the kitchen. Now, what we would do is we would put a gate and keep Andrew out of the kitchen because he'd go in there, and he would just drag stuff out of the cupboards. And this guy was, I mean, he was, I was well aware that he needed a change standing in the kitchen. But you know what? It wasn't convenient for me. <laughs> I was hoping that the rapture would come first before I had to deal with this thing. I certainly wasn't comfortable handling it. I put it off, put it off, put it off. <laughs> finally, he left. He was standing there at the gate just watching his daddy, and he finally toggled off. And I went over. And I was still barefoot. I hadn't gotten ready for the day. And I stepped over the gate. And there was something waiting for me right on the other side. And I stepped right in it. Boy, I'll tell you what. I had knowledge of a need. He came back to get me because I didn't have it. It just wasn't convenient at the time. It took me out of my comfort zone. Maybe there's times that we fail to act on knowledge of a need because we're not quite sure how to respond. I don't know. I say, well, what can I do? Pastor, you bring up the issues with abortion. What can I do with abortion? I see the needs in our nation, but what can I do? Sometimes maybe we find ourselves like Andrew when he had just that little, those, those loaves and those fish, and he brought it to Jesus. And what are these among so many? And what can this really accomplish? What can I do? Where can I go? You know what? We look back in the scripture and we know the response here in Nehemiah chapter 1. You know what Nehemiah did? That's the way that we should respond. Verse number 4. Prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. You see a need. How do you respond? You seek the Lord. It's interesting and you look in this passage. I just want to spend a little time reflecting now on Nehemiah's prayer. We could spend more time on why we don't move. We know that we should move. Knowledge isn't there simply for us just to have a head knowledge, but knowledge is something that brings responsibility, and we need to act on those things that we know to be true. So here we look in this passage. I just want to reflect on, on Nehemiah's prayer. As Nehemiah sees the issue, and Nehemiah, I'm sure, is moved, and, and, he, and he's thinking, you know, what can be done? And for days he prays, and he fasts, and he cries out to God. Do you know what the Lord does? Is the Lord answers. And the Lord provides someone who can go and rebuild that city. And the Lord brings somebody who can go and meet that need. And you know who that person is? It's Nehemiah himself. Now, I don't know when Nehemiah started out praying. I don't know if he was thinking to himself, let me be the one. But by the time he was done crying out to God, he knew that God had called him yeah, to be the one. Yeah. We can hear, and I, I love the testimony of some of the missionaries as they share with us. So I knew that there was a need in this country, and I just started praying, Lord, what are you going to do about this need? 
recall some of our missionaries who recently moved uh, uh, from being pastors and now being missionaries, going to uh, Argentina. You hear their testimony. So we would have missions conference, and we would tell others about this need, and I'd look into the just the world map, and the people around the world don't have what we had in America. And I just see the needs, the multitudes, and crying out, Lord, send somebody. And the Lord said, I'm sending you. Yeah. And you know, that's what happens here with Nehemiah. He's crying out, Lord, you see this need. I see this need. Look at your people. What can be done? No matter when it was that Nehemiah committed himself to addressing the need, we find that he asked the Lord to go before him and give him grace in the sight, he says in verse 11, of this man. He's talking about the king of Persia. And by the way, notice how he referred to him. He's just a man. He wasn't afraid of it. When he's standing and praying before Jehovah, when he's standing before the king of kings, what is any human king? What is the president of the United States? He's just a man. And his heart is in the hand of the Lord, just like everyone else's. He says, Lord, go and move on his, on his heart. Well, there's a couple principles here that we can see in his prayer life. First of all, as Nehemiah saw the need, as he felt the drawing to do something about the need, there's two things. He wanted, first of all, the Lord's permission, and second of all, he wanted the king's permission. Get a, get a hold of this for just a minute. I, I think for our young people, this is something that is important and really for all of us. We need to understand that we're not going to accomplish God's will by going against God-given authority. You know, people, did you hear the testimony of Brother Paul Crow this week when he was talking about how he uh, came into that relationship with his wife when he was a freshman in college? Hey, he was a fine, upstanding guy. Right? He was there serving the Lord. He's pursuing a, a ministry major. He wants to do what's right. And he finds a, a young woman who's a, a available. She's there as well. And, 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 and she also wants to serve the Lord. It looks like a match made in heaven. And in fact, indeed it was. But initially when he went to her father, what did the father say? No. Not right now. You need to focus on your studies and not get distracted with these things. You know what? He could have said, well, I'm all the way down here in North Carolina, and her dad's living up clear up in Indiana. He, what he doesn't know will hurt him. He could have said, well, he's being unreasonable. He could have said, he's somebody that, that you know, he's not in the will of God. I'm going to do my own thing. But do you know what? God prospered he and his wife's decision to respect the authority that God had brought in you know, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that example. Perhaps even as, as you are, as, as an adult, maybe you see a need at your workplace. You desire to begin some ministry there. Maybe it's something that, you know, you're concerned what the boss might say about it. Maybe you just need to seek the Lord. Lord, give me favor in the eyes of my employer. I'm going to be able to do this for you. Look, seek after God. Ultimately, we look at Nehemiah's prayer. We don't have time to read it here this evening. But notice three facets of his prayer. First of all, he confessed sin. And not only did he confess sin, but he also confessed who was really in charge. He said, Lord, you're the one that I need. You're the one that I serve. You are Lord. Lord of me. Second of all, he also asked for God's blessings. Seeking God's grace. He said in verse number 11, he says, I pray thee, give me thy servant and, and grant mercy. Give me your blessings. Prosper me. We go back to Jabez's prayer. Lord, that thou wouldest bless me indeed. And what he was crying out there in the Hebrew is literally, bless, bless me. It's doubled up. Bless, bless. And he's saying, just pour it out. He sought it for the Lord. And by the way, our Lord delights to bless His children. Isn't that a good thing? Aren't you thankful for that? We don't have to wonder, God, do you want to bless my life? We know that He does. In fact, Jesus said, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Think about that. Wrap your mind around it. God delights to give His children blessings. You don't have to think that God is someone who's just stingy. God has cattle on a thousand hills, and God daily loads us with benefits, and God longs to see our cup running over. You know, we also see this. We need to seek God's guidance through prayer. Sometimes we wonder, well, what should I do? Where should I go? I have knowledge of a need. A 
need in society, a need in church, a need in my home, a need here. There's needs all about us if we would open our eyes. We can see needs in the lives of others. We, we need to seek God's guidance. Lord, what would you have me to do? Maybe it's not me. Maybe it's someone else. Lord, would you raise up the one to go? But Lord, if, if, if it's me, here am I. Send me. There's a need, Father. Direct me. Show me. And we need to have a heart like Nehemiah is. You want to pray and pray. The Lord answered his prayer. Oftentimes we, sometimes perhaps go to the Lord and we're a little bit confused. You know, what about this? Or, or what about that? Maybe we're a little bit discouraged. You spend that time in prayer and the Lord and the Holy Spirit becomes a move on your heart. He starts to begin to share things with you and bring a verse of scripture back to your mind. And to bring something back to your memory or uh, one of those things, even as you pray, he begins to speak and to reveal his word. Seek after God. Seek to do God's will. There's a lot of needs to do. They're all around. We focused this last week on the needs of the lost. They're many. What do you do with that? We look through the church. We can see there's needs. Needs, uh, you know, again, in, in service opportunities. Needs in, 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 uh, uh, in maintenance. Needs in all sorts of things. Do with that knowledge. There's needs in your workplace. There's needs in, in, in your neighborhoods. There's needs all about us. Needs in our society. What are we doing with that knowledge? Will you seek after God? Lord, help me. Show me. What do you want me to do? What role do you want me to play? Ultimately, Lord, meet this. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this evening. We're thankful for the passage before us. We praise you, God, for how you moved on the Elias are and the Lord, I pray that knowledge of these truths would do the same to us. Lord, I don't know what you might be working on in somebody's heart tonight. Maybe there's someone here this evening who's already seen a need. Maybe there's somebody here who already has knowledge of a hurting brother or sister in Christ. Maybe there's someone here tonight who has knowledge of, of some need within uh, this body of believers. Maybe it's a knowledge of someone who's in another state. Lord, you know what you've laid on people's hearts. Maybe even in the midst of this message, bringing some things back to our attention. Maybe of a lost neighbor or coworker. Lord, you bring this knowledge to us for a reason. We know, Lord, what you have us to do. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to act where you have us to act. Help us to seek your grace and for you to open doors where those need to be open. Lord, to wait on your timing. I trust you. I pray, Father. Hear us today. Help us to be a people stirred to action, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand your feet if you would, with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. She's going to just play through a song here.